I'll read one verse from Srimad Bhagavatam, 10th Canto. This is from chapter number 3, the birth of Lord Krishna, just to set the stage for the advent of the Lord. And this is verse number, actually it's the first verse through the fifth verse in the third canto of Srimad Bhagavatam. We got one, two, three, four, five verses. So what we'll do is then we'll, rather than do all the Sanskrit, we'll uh, just take the first verse. Sri Sukha Uvacha Sri Sukha Uvacha Parama Sobanaha Yareva Jana Jar Marksam Santarksa Graha Tarakam Sri Sukha Uvacha Sri Sukha Uvacha Parama Sobanaha Yareva Jana Jan Marksam Santarksa Graha Tarakam Sri Sukha Uvacha Artha Sarva Gano Peta Parama Sobanaha Yareva Jana Jan Marksam Santarksa Graha Tarakam Sri Sukadev Goswami said, Atta, on the occasion of the Lord's appearance, Sarva, all around, Guna Upeta, endowed with material attributes or facilities, Kala, a favorable time, Parama Sobanaha. All auspicious and very favorable from all points of view. Yarhi, when, Eva, certainly, 
Ajana Janma Riksham. The constellation of stars known as Rohini. Shantariksha. None of the constellations were fierce. All of them were peaceful. Griha Tarakam. And the planets and stars like Asvini, Disha, all directions, Prasedu, appear very auspicious and peaceful. Ganganam, all of outer space, or the sky, Nirmala Udu Gana Udayam in which all the auspicious stars were visible in the upper strata of the universe. <coughs> Mahi, the earth, Mangalabhuyastapuragamaraja akaraha. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> Whose many cities, towns, pasturing grounds, as mines, and mines became auspicious and very neat and clean. Became and very neat and clean. Nadia, the rivers, the rivers. Pasana Salila, the, the waters became clear. Water became Rida, yeah. the lakes are large reservoirs of water. The lakes are large reservoirs of water. Jalaruha Shriya. Appeared very beautiful, <coughs> very beautiful because of blooming lotuses all around. Dvija Alakula Sandana Stavakaha. The birds, especially the cuckoos, and swarms of bees began to chant in sweet voices as if praying to the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Vana Rajaya, the green trees and plants were also very pleasing to see. Bhavo, blue, Vayu, the breeze, Sukha Sparsa, very pleasing to the touch. Punyaganda Baha, which was full of fragrance. <coughs> Suchihi, without pollution by dust. Agnayacha, and the fire, as the place of sacrifice. Dvijatinam, of the Brahmanas. Shanta, undisturbed. Steady, Steady, calm and quiet. Tatra, there. Samintata, blazed. Manamsi, the minds of the Brahmanas, who because of Kamsa had always been afraid. Asan became Prasanani, fully satisfied. And free from disturbances. Sadunam of the Brahmanas, who are all Vaishnav devotees. Asura Durham, who have been oppressed by Kamsa and other demons, disturbing the discharge of ritual ritualistic rituals. Janmamane because of the appearance of birth. Janane of Lord Vishnu, who is always born. Tasmin, in that situation. May do, resounded. Dundubaya, kettle drums. Samam, simultaneously from the upper planets. Very long translation. Thereafter, 
at the auspicious time for the appearance of the Lord, the entire universe was so charged with the qualities of goodness, beauty, and peace. The constellation Rohini appeared, as did stars like Aswini. The sun, the moon, and other stars and planets were very peaceful. All directions appeared extremely pleasing, and the beautiful stars twinkled in the cloudless sky. Decorated with towns, villages, mines, and pasturing grounds, the earth seemed all auspicious. The rivers flowed with clear water, and the lakes and vast reservoirs full of lilies and lotuses were extraordinarily beautiful. In the trees and grand plant, in green, green plants full of flowers and leaves, pleasing to the eye, birds like cuckoos and swarms of bees began chanting with sweet voices for the sake of the demigods. A pure breeze began to blow, pleasing the sense of touch and bearing the aroma of flowers. And when the Brahmanas engaged in ritualistic ceremonies, ignited their fires according to the Vedic principles, the fires burned steadily, undisturbed by the breeze. Thus, when the birthless Lord Vishnu, the Supreme Personality of Godhead, was about to appear, the saints and Brahmins, who had always been disturbed by the demons like Kamsa and his men, felt peace within the core of their hearts, and kettle drums simultaneously vibrated from the upper planetary system. That's the end of the translation. Srila Prabhupada's purport. <laughs> okay. As stated in the Bhagavad Gita, the Lord said in his appearance, birth and activities are all dibyam, transcendental, and that one who is actually understands them is immediately eligible to be transferred to the spiritual world. Very important statement. We'll read it again. Take this factually, it's not just some words or eulogies. As stated in the Bhagavad Gita, the Lord said that his appearance, birth, and activities are all transcendental, and that one who factually understands them is immediately eligible to be transferred to the spiritual world. Hmm. So simply by that statement alone, one can attain perfection in life, if one can understand. What does it mean to understand the, the birth, activities, and appearance of the Lord? That's a process of devotional service by when one engages in devotional service and hears the glories of the Lord. Gradually we understand through that process that Krishna is not part of this world. And his appearance in the world is simply for the benefit of the conditioned souls. So, um, to give you an example would be, there used to be a kind of an age-old, uh, what we say, folk tale. We might call it a folk tale or some kind of idea that when the sun appeared and then when it disappeared, that was the end of the sun. And then the next day you get a new sun when it comes again. But we understand from our angle of vision that the, the sun appears, travels through the eastern, southern sky, and then disappears over the western horizon, and then it goes somewhere else. It's out of our view, but someone else has experienced the presence of the sun depending on where they are. So in the same way, Krishna is appearing in one of the universes somewhere in the material world constantly. His pastimes and his activities are constantly going on somewhere, someplace in the material universes. So whoever is <coughs> in that particular place, they get the opportunity to get the benefit of the Lord's appearance. But then he disappears. That doesn't mean the Lord no longer exists. He just goes somewhere else. And that's even a common practical understanding. Just because you leave the house and the persons who are in the house see you, doesn't mean you know you're, you no longer exist because you're not within the purview of someone's vision. So in the same way, the Lord's appearance in this world is transcendental. Now that doesn't give you much of an understanding of the nature of the Lord. What does it mean to be transcendental? Well, one thing we can understand, it has nothing to do with anything material. In other words, when we analyze how things go on in this material world, we see there is a certain pattern. But Krishna doesn't fit into that pattern. He comes into the pattern, 
creates his own pattern and then disappears. <laughs> it's completely. It's just like, you know, to use a very crude example, if you're in a, a rainstorm, and but you're fully covered with all the necessary rain clothes, you know, coat, hat, whatever, umbrella, you can be in a very torrential rainstorm and still not be wet at all. But those who don't have that covering, they experience the rain. So in the same way, Krishna appears in this world, but he has nothing to do with this world. He doesn't touch the world at all, although it looks like it. <coughs> That's a little bit of the divya, at least in a philosophical, theoretical explanation. But to realize that, how do we realize it? This is the purpose of John Master. <laughs> It's the purpose of John Mahasabhi to hear about the, the transcendental nature of the Lord and how he appears in this world. And here, we see from this translation, everything became auspicious. The stars, the astrological arrangements, the decorations on the earth as described, the towns, the mining places, the cities, the villages, Whatever was on the earth actually became a decoration on the earth and was seen in that way, even by those who were living on the earth. Everything was auspicious. Rivers flowed nicely. Green trees and plants were in their natural environment blooming according to the arrangement of the Lord. Everything was nice. People's hearts and minds were completely peaceful. Simply by the Lord's appearance, everything changed. The whole atmosphere became, you might say, transcendental, free from the, the elements of the lower modes of material energy. And people who were there, they felt happy, even though they were afraid of Kamsa. But Kamsa had created such a harassment for all the persons there, and therefore, there was always the anxiety of the fear, and the fear of what will Kamsa do next to cause disturbance in the life of us here living in this world. So we'll go on and we'll read. The Lord's appearance at birth is not like that of an ordinary man who is forced to accept a material body according to his past deeds. The Lord's appearance is explained in the previous chapter. He appears out of his own sweet pleasure. He comes for our benefit, but he really comes for his own sweet pleasure. <laughs> we benefit because he wants to experience pleasure. That's, that's Krishna. <laughs> when we want to experience pleasure, sometimes not everybody benefits by that. <laughs> Especially if it, the pleasure is not authorized. <laughs> so but when Krishna wants to experience pleasure, anyone who has the good fortune to be in that arena where his pleasure is being experienced and gets also great amounts of pleasure. When the Lord was mature for the appearance, and when the, I'm sorry, when the time was mature for the appearance of the Lord, the constellation became very auspicious. The astrological influence of the constellation known as Rohini was also predominant because this constellation is considered to be very auspicious. Rohini is under the direct supervision of Lord Brahma, who was born of Lord Vishnu, and it appears at the birth of Lord Vishnu, who is factually birthless. According to the astrological conclusion, besides the proper situation of the stars, there are auspicious and inauspicious moments due to the different situations of the different planetary systems. At the time of Krishna's birth, the planetary systems were automatically adjusted so that everything became auspicious. Mm -hmm. At that time, all the directions, east, west, south, north, everywhere, there was an atmosphere of peace and prosperity. Auspicious stars were visible in the sky and on the surface in all towns and villages, pasturing grounds, and within the mind of everyone, there were signs of good fortune. The rivers were flowing full of water, and the lakes were beautifully decorated with lotus flowers. The forest was full with beautiful birds and peacocks, and the birds within the forest began to sing with sweet voices, 
and the peacocks began to dance with their consorts. Very festival description of what is happening by just the anticipation of what is about to come. The wind blew very pleasingly, carrying the aroma of different flowers, and the sensation of bodily touch was very pleasing. At home, the brahmanas, who were accustomed to offer sacrifices in the fire, found their homes very pleasant for offering. Because of disturbances created by demoniac kings, the sacrificial fire had been almost stopped in the house of the brahmanas, but now they could find the opportunity to start the fire peacefully. Being forbidden to offer fire sacri sacrifices, the brahmanas were very distressful in mind, intelligence and in activities. But just at the point of Krishna's appearance, automatically their mind became full of joy because they could hear loud vibrations in the sky of transcendental sounds proclaiming the appearance of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. Something auspicious. That was a pretty bad, but anyway, <laughs> something like that. On the occasion of Lord Krishna's birth, seasonal changes took place throughout the universe. Krishna was born during the month of September. Okay, I got a question for the audience. What day of the week was Krishna born? Huh? Who says Wednesday? Those who say Wednesday are correct. <laughs> he was born on midnight, the first day, minute of the day of Wednesday. That's mentioned by Jiva Goswami in Gopal Champu. So yeah, he was born on Wednesdays. So those of you who are born on Wednesday, you could feel good. <laughs> The atmosphere, what, the atmosphere, however, ever was very cool, although it appeared like springtime. Yet it was ch not chilly, and the rivers and reservoirs appeared just as they would in the Sarat fall season. The lotuses and lilies blossomed during the day, but although Krishna appeared at 12 o'clock midnight, the lilies and lotuses were in bloom, and the wind blowing at the time was full of fragrance. Shri Sri Pancha Tattva Ki Jai. Because of Kamsa's disturbances, the Vedic ritualistic ceremonies had almost stopped. The Brahmins and saintly persons could not execute the ritual, Vedic rituals and with peaceful minds. But now the Brahmanas were very pleased to perform their daily ritualistic ceremonies undisturbed. Okay, the business of the Asuras is to disturb the Asuras, the devotees and the Brahmanas. But that time, of Krishna's appearance, these devotees and brahmanas were undisturbed. Umgyan timirandasya gina jana salakaya chaksu unmilitam yena tasmai shri gurave namaha. Ma om vishnu padaya krishna prestaya bhutale shrimakti bhakti vedanta swami itiname. Namaste saraswati deve dorvani pacharine. Saisa Sunya Vari Pastyatya De Satarni Shri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nitananda Sri Advaita Gadadara Sri Vasari Gor Bhaktarin Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare Hare Ram Hare Ram 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 Hare Hare If we do that all day today we will feel the presence of Krishna. <laughs> Even if you do it half a day. <laughs> so, yeah, that's the idea. So here, sometimes the question is asked in relationship to this pastime, you know, there was a heavy burden on the earth. As Krishna says in the Bhagavad Gita, Yadaya Dharma Bhavadi Bharata. 
Abhutana madharma syata dhatma ham sujami ham pranitinayan sadhu nam vinasanaya chaduskutam dharma samstar panartayam sambhavame yuge yuge vinasanaya chaduskritam. So this is, what is that? That there was a heavy burden on the earth. What is that, demons? <laughs> Sounds familiar? Okay, we're getting a little bit of that taste today anyway, but that's another pastime. And therefore, demons' business, as they call it, is cause disturbance to others. There's no provocation from anybody, but that's their program, to cause people distress, <laughs> anxiety, whatever they can do to make your life miserable. And if they don't do that, they'll kill you so you don't have a life to be miserable anymore. <laughs> These are demons. The word Ravana, we know him. Ravana means one who causes others to cry. <laughs> that's just simply his meaning of his name. So demons, that's their program. So Mother Earth, she had been experiencing these demons that were causing this heavy burden. Mother Earth is the, is the uh, daughter, or you might say the wife, of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. So she acts according to the religious principles. But when people become irreligion, then everything goes down, and then people suffer, and the earth withholds, and there are so many calamities. Mother Earth gives, as a mother who loves their child, children gives, but she also re withholds when the children don't behave. And she's also there to punish when they really don't behave. So she is the agent for the Lord in this material world. So she has now been overburdened. She's a mother. Her name is Bhumi Devi. She's a living entity. It's not just some you know, idea that that's, sounds very nice, but she is a living being. And now she's distressed. She offers prayers to the demigods for relief. Prayers go all the way from Indra to Brahma. Brahma makes a note of it and says, we can't do anything, the demons are too much. We have to, this is the job of the Supreme Personality of Godhead. So they go to the ocean of milk, which is a, there's a planet in this material world called Dhruvaloka. And on that planet, there's an ocean of milk called Sweta Dweep, and there Lord Vishnu resides in this material universe. And the demigods, if they have, they come to the point of not able to solve the universal problems, and there's nothing they can do, then they petition the Lord to, for the Lord to do something. So in this case, they did, and they, the prayers they offered are very nice, called the Purusha Shukta prayers that's mentioned. Beautiful prayers offered by Brahma, along with many of the chief demigods, and the Lord listened and heard the prayer. Of course, he knew everything ahead of time. But it was time for the Lord to come. So you might ask, well, what was the situation prior that caused the Lord to have to come? Well, it mentions in the Mahabharata that when Parasaram was on earth, he didn't like Kshatriyas, especially Kshatriya kings who were very proud. And um, so he made it his policy to rid the world of these proud Kshatriya kings. So he killed 21 generations of Kshatriya kings. That's a lot. <laughs> and now what happened was there was hardly any rule left on the earth because all these Kshatriyas were king, killed. So now something had to be done to reestablish a new rule and something that would be auspicious, something that would be religious or saintly. And so, the royal families, who are now bereft of their ruling king, were in a quandary, what to do? How do we reestablish our rule on the earth? So there was an idea, and the idea was, the sages were also concerned. The rishis, the sages, they were also concerned. Now there is no leadership on the earth. 
what to do because the sages, they work in conjunction with the leadership to give advice. So then there was some plan made that the princesses, the daughters of the kings, would have union with the sages and produce a new class of saintly kings called Rajarsis. So that was a great sacrifice on the part of the sages, but they did it because they knew it was a service that was needed to be done. And after some time, a complete saintly rule was over the earth again. A whole class of saintly kings re got reestablished again. But you know what it's like in the material world. <laughs> Everything's temporary. <laughs> Sometimes we don't want it to be, but that's just the way it is. <laughs> and sometimes we want it to be, and it lasts longer than we do, <laughs> than it, it should, should last. It's just the way this material world works. And so then, after some time, many, many centuries, there was an, a big war in the uh, heavenly planets where the demons they have planets all over the universe, also the demons, various types of you know, demons. So they got together and attacked Indra and his forces in the heaven, and it was a huge fight. Now the demons were being, were being uh, destroyed, so they decided they needed some support to fight the demigods, so they decided that Earth would be a good place. <laughs> So then there was a plan amongst the demons, and they all took birth in different species of life. And that's what you hear. All of these demons that Krishna eventually killed, Agasura, and Bakasura, and Putana, and Sakatasura, and Keshi, and Bhyomasura, and Palambasura, all of these demons, Trinavarta, all of these demons were actually coming from this plan to retake over the earth and use it as a base to fight against the demigods. So now, the and Kamsa, he was also, he was one of the main demons. So now, again, after reestablishing saintly rule, the earth was back again with, with burden with so many demoniac kings. So that's where it, take, it takes us up to the present day, and that's where Krishna comes. Mm -hmm. So you get a little bit of understanding why, how those things happen. This is the nature of the material world. This is just, there's, Prabhupada said, don't stay around. <laughs> Try to go back home, back to Godhead. Kali Yuga's only gonna get worse. But Lord Chaitanya's process is here, and because of that, we can take shell, full shelter of Lord Chaitanya's process and chant the holy names of the Lord and be f completely free from the effects of um, Kali Yuga. Now I'm going to read something from the Hari Bhakti Vilas, and it's called The Vow of John Mastami. Um, it, it's a regular observ observance. And by following John Mastami, and I'll read what are the requirements for following John Mastami, one gets freedom from all sinful reactions immediately, if you follow this carefully, and all kinds of transcendental benefits. Prabhupada established John Mastami, and what he did, he demonstrated what he wanted for us to perform today. Aside from the activities in the temple, which will be, you know, the regulated activities, Prabhupada said every half hour we should be alternating be here before, be, between hearing about Krishna's pastimes and chanting japa, <laughs> going back and forth. So those of you who take part in temple programs all day, you'll have a full day, but those of you who decide to do something else, <laughs> Here's the way you can actually benefit from John Mastami. And then Prabhupada said there should be a special. This goes all the way up to midnight. We fast all the way to midnight. Midnight, Prabhupada said feasting is fasting, and fasting is feasting. <laughs> he 
he says there's no difference. <laughs> now, can we actually come to that realization? When you fast and you engage in hearing and chanting the glories of the Lord, you start to understand, yes, this is nice. Don't bring anything else. This is so nice. Prabhupada also writes, it's the most opulent day for the festival of devotees and with great problem. And in India, every house, at least every Hindu house, celebrates Jadmasami very opulently. Krishna emphasizes how it's important to emphasize how crucial this Krishna consciousness is. And then Prabhupada quotes this verse, Janma Karma Chime Divyam Evam Bhilti Tattvadaha Tattvat Paham Purnam Janma Naiti Mam Eti Sur Juna. We mentioned that earlier, how by hearing and chanting the glories of the Lord, getting absorbed in the activities, and this should be the only activity in, in uh, today's activity, we, we can put everything else aside today and simply focus on Krishna and the activities of John Mastami. Mm. Okay, so for, I'll read from the Hari Bhakti Vilas, what are some of the activities or the activities, there's 19 of them, that are actually the standard for following Janmasmi. We, we probably won't be doing all of these, but this is what it's mentioned. Rising early and taking bath. Two, physically announcing to the Lord one's determination to follow the vow of fasting and keeping that sankalpa throughout the day. Three, hearing, chanting, and remembering Krishna's names and his childhood pastimes throughout the day. Continue that throughout the following day until breaking one's fast. So actually, John Mastami goes all the way up to tomorrow. That's the actual ceremony. Until we actually begin our honoring of Srila Prabhupada. Bathing the deities on the altar and offering them a new dress. <laughs> Bathing at midday in holy river and other bodies of water. Performing Abhishek for the deity, along with the deity of Devaki. Interesting. Constructing a maternity ward, it's called Sutika Griha, and having little deities of Krishna and his parents as well, and bathing them. Installing prana, prana petitia and worshiping the maternity ward. Worshipping the moon with Argya at the moonrise. Describing the events of Krishna's birth and childhood pastimes, performing dramas that depict the same, and reading Bhagavad Gita, especially Leela Kirtan. Mm. This is number 11. Performing a birth ceremony prior to midnight, including bathing Krishna, cutting the un umbilical cord, worshipping goddess Shasti, and having a name-giving ceremony for Krishna in the maternity ward. You can see how elaborate the actual ceremony is. Decorating the deity room before midnight. At midnight, making offerings and performing arti. 14. Honoring a feast of Akadasi Prashadam at midnight. 15. Hearing narrations of Krishna's pastimes as well as the singing and dancing throughout the night. After a feast, you're all ready, right? And everybody's, everybody's ready for him, singing and dancing. At dawn, performing one's morning duties and offering prayers to the Lord. Performing worship of Durga Devi. I think we can just, just acknowledge that's listed here. Disturbing, uh, not disturbing, distributing charity and feeding the brahmanas. This is important, for, especially for grihastas. They should always, every day, grihastas should offer some kind of foodstuff to some living entities. And if one can feed the brahmanas, that is the highest form of charity. Completing the vow by breaking one's fast. And then here, this is written by Shiva Ram Maharaj. Srila Prabhupada may have made concessionary detail alterations for his disciples and followers, but he maintained and preserved the essential aspects of Janmasthami 
to do nothing else but glorify Krishna. That is the some of the ideas of Jadmasthami. So I'll speak a little bit about the actual pastime of Krishna's appearance, although my memory of it here, actually it is written here. But Kamsa was the king of all the demons. We heard from His Holiness Kadamakana Maharaj how he had subdued all of these other demons. That's mentioned in the Garga Samhita. That all of the powerful demons that eventually came to cause trouble to the residents of Vrindavan and tried to kill Krishna were subjugated in a fight by Kamsa. Kamsa was very powerful. Very, very powerful. And very, very nasty. <laughs> really a nasty person. Um, and he had made all these demons his servants. And if they didn't do what he said, there was, there's, you could read Garga Samhita, where there were a few that didn't want to do it. And so he even put more pressure on them and made them, you know, do this service of harassing Krishna. That was Kamsa. That was so many demons. So now, Kamsa is, uh, he's a maternal uncle of Krishna, of course, and his, Kamsa has a sister. Uh, his sister is Devaki. Kamsa is the son of Ugrasena. That's a long story how that happened. And Ugrasena is a saintly king, but his mother was somehow what we say, duped into having relationships with a demon. The demon disguised their, himself and had union with the, the wife of, Kam, of, of Ugrasena, and that has the how uh, Kamsa came. So Kamsa is there, and now he's the, he takes his father's throne, throws him off the throne, captures the throne of Indra in the heavenly planets and brings that throne down to Madura and sits on the throne. He didn't, this, Prabhupada said, this is, this, is, this is like a side note, the demons will do anything. And then he said, they will do anything. <laughs> they'll kill their parents, they'll kill their sons, they'll kill... They don't care. This is a real demon. Anything for their own sense gratification, they would do. And Prabhupada said, and right now in Kali Yuga, Prabhupada said, the demons are only increasing. Mm -hmm. Haribo. Good news. <laughs> <laughs> but Lord Chaitanya's movement is also the counteracting of this demoniac force in the world. It's the only counteraction. And we have that conviction that there's nothing that can save us or the world than Lord Chaitanya's Sankirtan movement. And it's the Sankirtan movement that is the most powerful force of Lord Chaitanya's movement. It can, it can make these demons look like just, you know, just like insignificant little insects. <laughs> That's the power of this movement. <laughs> Very powerful because it's it's empowered by the Lord itself. It's not different than the Lord. And so Kamsa now, his uh, sister is getting married to one very respectable and a very saintly person named Vasudeva. Now Kamsa gets a little bit of feeling of I want to do something good for my sister. Sometimes demons do that. <laughs> they get they become nice for a little while. <laughs> and it makes them look good. As Krishna also says that in the Bhagavad Gita, they give in charity. They give in charity. So they think, well, I give in charity, therefore, you know, people will even respect me more. And so it's just they don't really care, they just do it in order to get some, you know, benefit from that. So Kamsa was feeling a little, you know, nice. So he 
wanted to drive the chariot to the home of Vasudev where his sister would now be residing. And so he takes the reins, he's feeling good about doing this service, and then they're on their way and then the voice comes out of the sky and comes, you're a fool. <laughs> you know, the eighth child of your sister will be the cause of your death. Devaki, Vasudev, everyone heard it. Kamsa became completely overwhelmed with anxiety. He changes his, his mind. Now there's no threat from his sister. But still, an eighth children, now how far in the future is that? That's a long time when you think about it. Now he's ready to kill his sister. Demoniac mentality. Doesn't have any regard for anything. So he takes out his sword, but Vasudeva is very diplomatic and very quick. It's the duty, this is a side thing. You ready guys, you got this one? Okay. Ladies, they know this, but the men sometimes forget. <laughs> it's the duty of the husband to protect the wife. That's one of the jobs of being a husband. You have to give protection to your wife. That means you have to risk your life even if they're in trouble. That's the duty according to Vedic culture. I remember I was giving a class in Croatia. It was at the camp and I was talking about this particular subject. And the husband was sitting on one side and the wife was sitting on the other side. And a big hornet bug, you know, big one with a big stinger, start flying around this one lady, Mataji, and she's going, ah! So I looked at her husband, what are you going to do, you know? <laughs> <laughs> he didn't do nothing. <laughs> uh, what happened? I just, I'm just telling you what the philosophy is and, you know, the practical application also. I didn't do nothing. Uh, somehow or other, she survived. <laughs> I, you know, husbands need a little bit of, you know, encouragement nowadays. <laughs> huh? Need their honest thing, perhaps. Get them moving. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Whatever you said, I agree. <laughs> I'm not sure what you said, but I agree anyway. <laughs> Yeah, so now he takes out his sword, but Kam, Vasudev is just, he's thinking what to do. And then he starts to speak about the temporary nature of the material world, and, and death will come to everyone. So Kam said, why are we getting so riled up? Everyone has to die. Now, you tell that to a demon. <laughs> it wasn't the best thing, but he somehow interrupted Kamsa's activities, and therefore he spoke philosophical. Kamsa was not listening. He was getting more and more angry. And then Vasudev had to do something that he knew would work, and being very intelligent, he said, he had to save the situation. It didn't matter what was going to happen in the future. Sometimes you just have to save the situation. So he did that. And he said, Kamsa, don't worry. The eighth child, when it's born, I will present it to you and you can whatever you decide. Kamsa was pacified by that. And sometime, somehow he continued. <coughs> now, <clears throat> Nada the moon, you from the womb of Devaki to the womb of Rohini, who is in Vrindavan, and that way he'll be safe. And Rohini is also pregnant at the time. Mm -hmm. So she was thinking, I mean, I've been, in, I can do some amazing service, but this? <laughs> and Krishna said, you're the only one that can do it. And I'll empower you. So she accepted it. And so it appeared that Devaki had a miscarriage. She just woke up one night and she realized the child in her womb was no longer there. 
And the same thing happened to Rohini, and that child was replaced by that child in the womb of Devaki and now in the womb of Rohini. And therefore Balaram took birth in Vrindavan as the son of Rohini and also he was mothered by Mother Yasoda. So sometimes he's considered both the son of Rohini and Yasoda because they both were his mothers. And he grew up in, Vrind in Vrindavan. And now the seventh, the seventh child, Kamsa was thinking what happened. And then what happened was that I'm getting it sooner or later. I'm just doing this by memory. Um, then the eighth pregnancy came. And even to, without even noticing, Krishna appeared outside of the womb of Devaki. Of course, it was explained by Maharaj that this type of birth was divya, transcendental, or what we say, immaculate conception. That the mind of Vasudeva was pure consciousness. And transferring that pure consciousness to the mind of his wife Devaki, and then that pure consciousness descended, or when we say entered into the womb of uh, Devaki, and now she's pregnant for the same time. This is called transcendental, and this is immaculate conception. We cannot perform that, but we can. what we can do to bring about auspicious progeny in our own life is we very carefully follow the rules and prescriptions for bringing about a saintly child. The entire world is overburdened with what is called varna sankara, unwanted progeny. And these unwanted progeny are actually due to just people living a life like animals, well not even animals, animals actually follow the season for conception. They follow God's nature. Human beings have that free will to abuse that, that you know, natural way of bringing children into the world and it becomes just a, just a wild affair. And what happens? You get all these children born into the world that are ferocious. Just like I'm in, you know, I was, I was born in the United States of America. I guess years ago we used to be very, I'm an American. <laughs> That's good. But now, whew. Forget it. <laughs> it's like the worst place to be. <laughs> well, you know, if you, uh, unless you're a New Yorker, it's the worst place to be. Because <laughs> New Yorkers never give up. <laughs> you know, you've been to New York, right? <laughs> so they're a different breed. <laughs> Anyway, so the children, some of the children born in America, you know, they're, they're shooting their fellow students in classes. They can take automatic rifles and go to the schools and just gun down half the class. You know. This happens. These, these are like kids that are 17, 18, 19 years old, just shooting their fellow students. It happens so many times. <laughs> so many times. And, uh, you know, but then around the world in different places, it's another feature of, you know, the degradation of the population. So following this vana, the proper Garbhadhan Samskara, and, and even there is a ceremony before Garbhadhan Samskara to prepare the womb even prior to that. And... If devotees follow that very carefully, then you can guarantee a saintly child will definitely descend within your family. Very saintly. And the more you follow it, and the more you practice your own devotional service, you may even get an incarnation. <laughs> well, not likely, but could happen. <laughs> so that's how important it is to follow these principles. So now Krishna appears in the jail cell of Kamsa 
and he's fully decorated with all opulence. He's got crown, he's got bangles, he has all of the, the beauty of Vaikuntha. He's dressed so nicely with um, jewelry. And, and Devaki sees him. And what is her? She has natural parental love for her child. She's so happy to see him, but at the same time she has this anxiety that Kamsa will kill him. So she's very fearful. She offers prayers, she offers obeisances, and after she does all that, she says, hide yourself. Now, think about it. Here's God. Nobody can kill God. <laughs> God kills everybody. <laughs> Nobody can. But she, because of her motherly love, it is so strong, she can't think of anything more in relationship to that child, although he is the Supreme Lord himself, and she knows that. <laughs> so that's, that's the beauty of devotional service, that the love overshadows the opulences. You know? Especially in Vatsaya Ras. <laughs> and so her love is so strong, and then she says, hide yourself. <laughs> and then Krishna changes himself into an ordinary child. And then he gives a signal to Vasudev, get me out of here. <laughs> and Vasudev picks up on the signal in his heart that it's time to hide Krishna, what to do. It's late at night, Krishna took birth, appeared in the jail cell at midnight. And so, when he did, all the guards fell asleep, and Kamsa was nowhere around. So Vasudev now understands, I need to give Krishna some safety. And Krishna directs him, bring me to Vrindavan. So he carries the child, and it's raining. Not only is it raining, it's a huge rainstorm. And in order to get to Vrindavan from Mathura, he has to cross the Jamuna. And the waves of the Jamuna are turbulent. So he, when he's carrying him, he's actually walking waist deep in water. And then Ananta Shays thinks, here's a chance to do some seva. So he comes with his multi-headed you know, serpents, and he acts like an umbrella as Krishna is being carried across the Jamuna. And Vasudeva is wading through the water. Now, at one point, Krishna decides to have a little fun. And he jumps out of the arms of Vasudeva and falls in the turbulent waters of Jamuna. And Vasudeva is beyond himself and he's looking for the child. He's thinking, oh no. Finally, he finds Krishna, he picks him up, and Krishna is fine. Why did Krishna do that? Because Jamuna needed some mercy. So in order to show mercy to that beautiful river, which is very dear to Krishna, he gave her a chance to worship, to wash his lotus body <laughs> and give him, you know, special, special, special service. Now Vasudev finally gets to Vrindavan. It's late. And he goes directly to the house of Nanda Maharaj and Mother Yasoda. And Mother Yasoda has just had a child. And she was asleep at childbirth, so she wasn't aware exactly of what the child was. And now Vasudev comes and he sees this little, little, tiny, tiny girl. And he takes baby Krishna, puts him down, and takes the girl, and then returns to the jail cell. Mm -hmm. Now this is interesting, because sometimes we hear that the real mother and father of Krishna is Devaki and Vasudev. But actually, the Acharyas say, and it's also mentioned in the Bhagavatam, that Krishna took birth in two places at once. He took birth as Vrindavan Krishna, in Vrindavan, as the son of Mother Yasoda, and as Vaikuntha Krishna in the jail cell of Kamsa with Devaki. 
But he remained somewhat, uh, how do we say, use the word invisible or unmanifested. That's a better word. And when Vasudev put the baby child down, the two Krishnas merged into one. Mm. And that's interesting because it later uh, gives you an understanding because Krishna in Vrindavan doesn't kill demons. Mm -hmm. The Vrindavan Krishna doesn't kill demons, but the Vasudev Krishna was in, within Krishna, manifested through this particular leader. So that's the, the manifestation of the Supreme Lord that was killing demons in Vrindavan. Although it appears that Krishna was doing it. So this is, this is a little understanding of this Leela, or the Tattva of the Leela. And now Vasudev gets back. It's still late. He gets there in time. The guards are still sleeping. The chains go back on. Finally, the word gets out the next morning. Kamsa, the eighth child, is born. Kamsa is like, oh, here's my destiny. Has come to kill me. So he really runs to the jail cell and he sees his sister holding this little tiny girl and he looks and she says, Kamsa, it's a girl. Kamsa's confused. He doesn't know what to do. And Kamsa's going and she says, no, no, don't take care. Don't take it. It's a girl. There's no threat from that. And she's begging her brother, please. He doesn't hear anything. Finally, he rips the child away from his mother and takes her, and he's about to smash the child on a rock. And when he raises the child up, the child descends above his hand and manifests many forms, many arms in one form, she says, Kamsa, you fool. You can't kill me. <laughs> and actually, the eighth son of Devaki has already been born somewhere else. Ha, ha, ha! <laughs> Not like that. She didn't do that. But, but she was, you know, she was saying, ha, huh, you think you're so smart, you, you know, demon. <laughs> and uh, Kamsa is like, because, you know, Kamsa worships Durga Devi, and this is a manifestation of one of the forms of Durga Devi. So he's seeing his worshipful Lord chastising him. <laughs> and then it's mentioned that she, she appears in different places by different names. So Kamsa, now he's repentant. He's thinking, oh, what happened? He goes back to his sister. I'm sorry. <laughs> I killed all of your children. I'm sorry. And he's just kind of like, he's practically like a little wimp, you know. <laughs> this big demon, all of a sudden, he, he gets kind of soft. <laughs> what if something happened? We don't know. It doesn't last for long. <laughs> and uh, so now he's apologizing, and David, he says, you know, we forgive you. And Vasudev says, yes, we forgive you. You're just a stupid demon. I mean, what can, what can you do? <laughs> and so they forgive him, and then now Krishna is born. So Krishna wanted to immediately leave the jail cell, not only because, you know, Kamsa couldn't kill Krishna, even if he tried, but Krishna was anxious to get to Vrindavan. That's the real, well, I might say, out of all the reasons why Krishna was le left the jail cell, he wanted to get to Vrindavan because he's Lila Purushottam. He loves to perform pastimes with his devotees. And he came to manifest those pastimes in Sri Vrindavan Dham. Hmm. So there's a, where is it? I have it here someplace. How much time do we have? Not much. Huh? Oh, we need somebody to tell me what to do here. How much time do we have? Because I could go on all morning, but I know it's not allowed. Anybody? No managers. That's good. We're, we believe in anarchy. 9.30. 9.30. It's 10 minutes. Okay. Hmm. I want to read something here. This is, this is from, uh, from Gopal Champu, 
by uh, Sri Kavi Kanapur. And it's a beautiful, this is a beautiful description of Krishna taking birth in Vrindavan. Hmm. I'll read a little bit. Now, uh, Mother Yasoda awake and she hears that the chattering of the gopis. She leans over the bed to see and admire her gorgeous son. She sees now a beautiful boy. But upon noticing her own reflection in Krishna's body, she sees her reflection, she imagined it to be another woman. Thinking that a witch had assumed her form to kidnap Krishna, Yasoda became bewildered and yelled, Get out of here! You go away! Spontaneously, she cried out to Nusringadev to protect her precious son. Beholding Krishna's tender face, Krishna, Yasoda showered tears of affection that looked like an offering of a pearl necklace. Yasoda saw Krishna's body as a mound of dark blue musk, softer than the butter churned from the milk ocean. Overflowing with nectar, his charming body appeared like the foam of milk. But being dark blue in color, it seemed the foam was full of musk juice. Admiring the supremely delicate form of her son, Yasoda worried about his safety and feared the touch of her body might hurt his tender body. Wow. His body was so tender, she was thinking my touch would, would cause him some harm. As she leaned over the bed, Yasoda bathed Krishna with the milk dripping from her breasts. The elderly gopis instructed Yasoda how to caress the baby in her lap and affectionately pushed the nipple of her breast into Krishna's mouth to feed him. Due to Yasoda's intense love, personified bliss flowed from her breasts as steady streams of milk. And the milk of a mother to the son is actually the mother's love for the son. It's actually the mother's love. The more the mother has love for the son, the more milk there is. <laughs> Amen. When milk sometimes spilled out of Krishna's bimba fruit lips onto his cheeks, Mother Yasoda would wipe his face with the edge of her cloth. After feeding her son, Mother Yasoda gazed affectionately at him in wonder. She saw her child's body as made of dazzling blue sapphires. His mouth resembled a red bimba fruit, and his hands and feet looked like exquisite rubies. Krishna's nail shone like precious gems. In this way, Yasoda thought her child was completely made of jewels. Then she perceived that his naturally reddish lips looked like baduka flowers. His hands and feet resembled java flowers. His nails looked like Malati flowers. Yasoda then thought, Krishna's whole body seems to be made of a blue lotus flowers. He does not appear to be mine. After thus deliberating in this way, Yasoda became stunned in amazement. The beautiful soft curly hair on the right side of Krishna's chest resembled the tender streams of a lotus. Seeing the mark of Srivas on his chest, Yasoda thought it was breast milk that had previously spilled out of his mouth. She tried unsuccessfully to remove these milk stains with the edge of her cloth. They're not milk stains, they're actually his hair. Struck with wonder, Yasoda thought this must be the sign of a great personality. Observ observing the sign of Lakshmi, the small golden line on the left side of Krishna's chest, Yasoda thought a small yellow bird had made a nest amidst the leaves of a tamal tree. Could this be a streak of lightning resting on rain cloud? Or could it be a golden streak marking a black gold testing stone? Krishna's delicate leaf-like hands and feet, glowing pink like the rising sun, looked like clusters of lotuses floating in the Jamuna. Sometimes Krishna saw the curly dark blue locks of baby Krishna as swarms of bumblebees surrounding his face. 
Intoxicated from drinking too much honey nectar, the bees just hovered in the sky. His thick, beautiful blue hair appeared like the dark night. The two lotus eyes of Krishna looked like pairs of blue lotus buds. His cheeks resembled two huge bubbles floating in a lake of liquefied blue sapphires. Krishna's attractive ears looked like a pair of fresh, unfurled leaves growing on a blue creeper. The tips of Krishna's dark nose appeared like the sprout of a tree, and his nostrils looked like bubbles in the Jamuna, the daughter of the sun god. His lips re resembled a pair of red java flower buds. Krishna's chin rivaled a pair of ripe rajumba fruits. Seeing the extraordinary beauty of her son fulfill the purpose of her eyes and submerge Yasoda in an ocean of bliss. The elderly Vrajavasi ladies address Nanda, O oh, most fortunate one, you fathered a son. Previously, Nanda Maharaj had felt deeply aggrieved over his long standing of inability to obtain a son. His heart was like a small lake that had completely dried up during the hot summer. But when Nanda Maharaj heard of his son's birth, he felt as if the dry lake of his heart had been blessed with a southern downpour of nectar. The gentle sound of Krishna's voice removed all his grief and lamentation. Now he bathed in the rains of bliss, swam in the ocean of nectar, and felt embraced by the joyful streams of the celestial Ganges. So you get a little bit of the beauty of Krishna from this description here. Gopal Champu. So um, out of all of the opulences of Krishna, the devotees are very much attracted to his transcendental beauty. His beauty attracts the devotees more than anything. Of course, his compassion is even more attractive. He's very compassionate. So today, we have a full day of activities. Just keep it Krishna. <laughs> Try to use your the, the whole day, just whatever else, turn out that, turn off the phones, you know, unless you have something on there that's Krishna conscious. But try to immerse yourself today completely, and then when you'll forget that you're hungry. <laughs> and if somebody reminds you, you'll get angry at them. <laughs> so, you know, if you, because when we become absorbed in Krishna, then it's, everything else just fades. There's nothing. So that is the idea. Here enchant the glories of the Lord. And of course we have Chaitanya Mahaprabhu and all his wonderful associates to give us their beautiful darshan throughout the day. Well, thank you very much. Shri Janmastami Mahotsava Ki Srila Prabhupada Ki Jai.